Welcome back, my dear students. In the previous part of the first lecture, we have demonstrated together the concept of doping in semiconducting material, resulting either in a p-type doping with um, or, or a third group doping leading to a p-type material with Fermi level more toward the valency band, or a n-type doping with. Uh, uh, third group material leading to a Fermi level more toward the conduction band. And now the next step is forming a PN junction. Again, we are going this process as a part of understanding the concepts inside the solar cells. So once we combine this to Fermi level or to energy band diagram and in order, in order to have a reference, our reference is the indicator, which is a Fermi level. Again, you can hear more about the Fermi levels if you visit my uh, solid state electronics course. Uh, you can find it in the same YouTube channel. And in both cases, for the for the rough hand side and the rough hand side junction, the the definition of the Fermi level is a level at which the probability to find an electron is equals to uh, uh, half. So, so and. Uh, Energy band diagram under thermodynamic equilibrium is defined as a, an energy band diagram with a pure horizontal Fermi level. So to combine these two junctions, you have to plot a constant horizontal Fermi level, and then you could plot EC and EV per junction with respect to this reference Fermi level, which results in this structure. As you can see, this is a constant horizontal Fermi level, now, in this P type region, the Fermi level is more close to the valency band, and here it's more close to the conduction band. Uh, 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 the reverse action is here. Here it's more toward the uh, 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 conduction band and far to from the uh, valency band and so on. So this is an, an, an a P type region. This is an N type region. Actually, what is very interesting now is this region this region what we call in electronics as a building potential region we call it a building potential simply because if you have an electron let's let's, let's use the annotation again okay. if you have an electron here this electron will move to this direction so i will use again my this electron will move to this direction it, it will slide it will drift However, as I just mentioned, this PN junction is under thermodynamic equilibrium. There is no applied external voltage. That's why we call this as a build-in drift. It's a build-in potential occurs due to the formation of this PN junction. In electronics, we usually call this as a depletion region because simply there is no electrons here or there is no holes here if you have any electron it will slide to the right if you have any hole it will slide to the left so this is simply the formation of the building potential or the depletion region so how this pn junction how this formed pn junction will act as a solar cell let's see now let's assume that our optical injection will be directed to this P type region. So this is the front side to the sun. Once you have a photon here, and this photon has an energy greater than or equal the band gap of the material, for example, silicon, the, the electron occupied here in the valency band will jump to go to the conduction band and absorb the photon. Now, this electron will have the capability to drift, to slide over this drift to go to this side. And this is simply the definition of electrical current. If you go to the physics classes you have enrolled in a few years ago, you know that I or the current equal dq by dt. So the definition of electrical current is the motion of, or the rate of a change of a free carrier. So let's do it again. Here we have a photon. This photon has been collected by the electron in the valency band. The electron in the valency band will jump to 
a free electron or become a free electron in the conduction main here. And then due to the drift, it will slide to go in this direction and will create an electrical current. This is simply the process. So by doing this process, you can have an electrical current. But please take care. When we start the process, we said that this is a p-type region. And if you remember our description for a p-type region, we said that in a p-type region where we have a doping of a, three, a third group material, the number of holes is greater than the number of electrons. So simply speaking, here in, in this region, let me mark this. In this region, the number of holes, the number of electrons is smaller than the number of holes. So this, let me get, sorry. This created electron is called in semiconductor physics as a minority carrier. Why is that a minority carrier? Because simply it's the is a number of electrons here is minor with respect to the number of holes in this uh, uh, purple or uh, purple box, as you can see. So in this case, we usually have a very important code to be said here, that the current flowing in solar cells is a current due to minority carriers. It's a reverse current, not a forward current in terms of a PN junction formation. And this will attribute to the shape of the IV curve that you will see in the next chapter, inshallah. So in this structure, in this structure, the, the main function or the main driving force is the minority carriers, not the majority carriers. And also you can easily recognize that by absorbing each photon, an electron hole pair is created and electron is drifted. So simply speaking, the number of generated uh, the number of generated photons, uh, or sorry, number of generated electron is directly proportional to the number of captured or absorbed photons. So the higher the number of photons absorbed, the higher the number of electrons. And as I just said, that the current is equal to dq by dt or the rate of the change of a charge, you can say that the current is directly proportional to the absorption current. That's why the absorption force, I'm sorry. So that's why when I said to you that the current in a solar cell is the best indication to the absorption, you can understand it from here. The higher the absorption in the solar cell, the higher the current. It's a direct relationship. So here you can understand that the basic concept of a solar cell is related of a PN junction with the motion of a minority carrier due to the optical generation using a photon where the photon energy is equal to or greater than the bank of time. But the question is, if these solar cells we or solar modules we see everywhere around us is simply a PN junction? The answer is no. The PN junction is called the main active region in a solar cell. It is the place or it is the layer at which the electron hole pair generation occurs and the carrier transport occurs. However, in order to make a solar cell, you are going to make a, a huge number of cascaded layers with different functions and with different job description. We are going in the next slides to sh sh um, show or to make some highlight on the function of some of these layers and why we are going to insert these layers in our solar cell. Let's see one of these examples. For example, from the beginning we have mentioned that we use semiconductors, mainly silicon, as the core for fabricating this PN junction. So Simply, you can make a PN junction and you can direct this PN junction to a sum. And herein, you could expect some voltage jump current to be produced, which is totally correct. However, let's see this example. 
what if I put silicon directly to a light? Generally speaking, when you have a light beam injected to a layer, usually we call it with a thin film or a film of a layer. Oh, let's call it layer at least. So when we inject a light beam into a layer, there is logically three probabilities to, to, to occur. This light can be absorbed in the material or can be reflected back or it can be transmitted. For example, if you direct a piece of glass, like for example, my, uh, my medical glass, if you direct this glass to a light beam, you can expect that nearly most of the light will be transmitted. That's why glass is a transmitted material. Roughly, we are considering 92% of the light to be transmitted to the other side. However, if you put a piece of silicon, you can expect that the transmission is minimum, tends to zero. Most of the light will be absorbed or should be absorbed, but still there is a possibility that some of the light will be reflected back. Okay, so this reflection is a parasitic effect in solar cells because simply this is considered losses. Your target is to absorb as much protons as you can. So the higher the reflection, the higher the losses. Is it possible to calculate or to estimate the reflection? Yes, the answer is yes. If you go to this Fransel's rule, which is a very basic rule in optics, you can estimate the reflection. It says that the reflection is equals to n2 minus n1 over n2 plus n1 all square. The output here is, uh, if you multiply this by 100, it will become a percentage. So it's a ratio to be converted into percentage. The refractive index of R is equal to 1. The refractive index of silicon is around 3.5. In other texts, you can find it 3.9, whatever. If you make this calculation right down your calculator, you will find that nearly the R will result with about nearly 29%. That's meaning that if you fabricate a silicon solar cell and direct the silicon solar cell directly to a uh, sun, 30% of the instant photon will be lost as a reflected photon. Of course, this is a very big loss because you start with a process where with only 70% of the input. You lose, in, 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 the, in the interface of the material, you lose 30% of your input light. That's why we have to insert another layer in front of solar cells. Of course, and obviously, this layer should be a, transmit, a transparent layer to permit light to go to the solar cell. But also, it should be, or it should reduce this reflection on the solar cell. The best layer to be chosen here is glass. And this is why we do what we call encapsulation process for a solar cell. The encapsulation process where we insert a glass layer just above the silicon solar cell or the silicon junction is used to minimize the reflection from the solar cell. Now, if you go and calculate the reflection here, you will find that this 29% will be reduced to nearly 14%. 14 so it's another 50% enhancement in your efficiency. So you gain more 15% and you keep only a loss of 14%. Of course, these losses can be enhanced more and more by using what we call an anti-reflective coating techniques. This anti-reflective coating technology is very famous not only in solar cells, but also even in glass, in, in, in some glasses and medical glasses and another, other, other applications where you need to minimize reflection because typically, as I mentioned in glass industry, for example, you use, you use to minimize reflection because you, your target is to maximize transmission. Here in, in solar cell, we, our target is to maximize absorption. So that's why we need to get rid of the reflection uh, or the reflected 
people. That's why we, uh, we are doing such a technology. But another important factor also related to the absorption and the reflection is what we call the electrodes. Basically speaking, any electronic device should be connected using electrodes in order to be connected to a load. And this is something very basic in electronics. So if I say that, okay, I have a solar cell, the silicon solar cell or whatever, and I need to make this, my two electrodes. So very simple. Let me use again my whiteboard if you permit me. Here and let's do our, let's make our, yeah. Okay, so let's say here we have a PN junction, which acts as a solar cell. By the end of the day, you have some sort of a load here and you need to connect this, so, this uh, uh, solar cell with the loads using these two electrodes. Usually we put two electrodes like here, here and one electrode and here this another electrode. For those who don't have uh, a, a big background about electrical devices, electrode is a metal which collects electrons on the holes or electrons typically and make them move in the circuit so that we have a closed circuit like this. Okay, so this is typically a case and we have our sun is directed here in this case. Okay, what is an electrode? Is electrode is a metal. The most famous electrode, for example, is copper. So you are going to put to put this piece of copper on your solar cell on the front co contact and on the back or the counter contact, and you will make going to make this closed circuit, closed loop or closed or a closed circuit with your loop. There is a very important problem here that copper is not a transparent material. So whenever you insert this copper electrode in the front terminal of a solar cell, this will cause what we can call a partial shading to the cell. Because simply only this region will be directed to photons, but this region, let's make it in another color, but this region, will not be directed to photons because there is an obstacle, which is electrode. This was one of the big problems facing the solar cell industry in the beginning. Recently, maybe 20 years ago or something like that, a new technology starts to glow up to solve this problem, which we call it a transparent conducting of oxides or what's called the TCOs. The TCOs or the transparent conducting oxide uh, is one of the very promising uh, uh, techniques to create a material which is transparent and conductive. So you can use it in the front surface of your solar cell to act as a front electrode and in the same time it it does the same function as your glass, uh, as an encapsulated front layer, as an anti-refractive coating or AC, ARC. One of the, or two of the most famous TCOs are the um, RTO or indium tin oxide and the FTO or fluorine dope tin oxide. FTOs and RTO and ITOs are very famous in this uh, application. Okay, let's go to this more and more uh, sophisticated technologies. Another way to enhance the absorption of your uh, solar cell is to use such texture structure. We call this a front structure, anti a front uh, anti-reflective coating structure. Usually, this is some sort of nanostructure to be fabricated on the top surface of a solar cell. The, very, the, the, the principal concept here is when you have an incident light here, this incident light, either it enters the material or it will reflect. 
if you adjust this triangular texture structure, the reflected beam will be go to another point still in the surface. So you can collect against the reflected beam. That's why it enhances the collection uh, probability of your light beam. And this is one of the most famous. Of course, there is a um, hundred, maybe thousands of structure, not only this texture, triangular structure, but this is maybe one of the most famous. But if you go to the literature and search under the title of light capping structure, exactly front light capping structure, you will find a lot, a lot of uh, structures that can act for this purpose. Now we show you some alternative in order to minimize the error coming from the reflected beam, starting from adding an anti-reflective coating in the form of a glass, or it may be a TCO, so that it can also act as an electrode, or it can be a texture structure, uh, texture structure to collect more and more light. But please don't, uh, don't forget that. You still have another source of error, which is the transmission. In solar cells, in conventional solar cells, transmission is not a big deal. It's a very, very, very minimum losses. However, when we turn to the next generation of solar cells, which is thin film technology, in the film, in the thin film technology, the main aspect in the design is to minimize the thickness of your active layer. Typically, in terms of number, in conventional solar cells, we are considering up to 200 micrometer PN junction thickness. This 200 micrometer can be shrunk to be in terms of one micrometer or more be less, or maybe less, sorry, whenever you are considering thin film technology. So when you make it such a shrink, you add a very important aspect that you decrease the cost or you reduce the cost of the solar cell because basically you reduce the volume of a material you are using. However, this introduces a very important problem. This is simply when you reduce the thickness, the probability of transmission increases because simply you reduce the thickness of the active layer and you can easily expect that Whenever you reduce the thickness of an active layer, the amount of absorbed photon decreases, which means that transmission increases. So in this aspect, uh, absorption in thin film solar cells is significantly lower than absorption in uh, conventional thick solar cells. One of the ways to maximize absorption in thin film technology is to use what's called a light trapping structures. In the light trapping structure, you add or you sandwich your thin film, your thin film between two light trapping structures so that when light enters your solar cell, it becomes trapped. So you trap your light beam. As far as you trap your light beam, you maximize what's called the optical pulse lens and automatically you maximize the efficiency or the capturing absorption efficiency of your solar cell. That's why light trapping structures starts to appear in literature whenever we have thin film technology. Maybe in the conventional silicon solar cells, we don't need to add all these stuff because it's already a thick layer. But please take care of that. Adding the, such nanostructure as a light trapping structure, not only adding a cost for a solar cell, but also it adds complexity because usually these nanostructures are very difficult to be fabricated. A third, or, or generally speaking, the light trapping structure added to the front layer should perform high transparency, which is a very, very important point. I see a lot of massive research Maybe myself, I was examiner to more than two or three master researchers who have worked on adding uh, a layer on the front of a solar cell. However, this layer is not transparent enough. Now, you have a very big problem concerning the 
amount of light reaching the active layer. So whenever you add a layer in the front of a solar cell, you have to think about transparency. A second point is to make a forward scattering, which is very, very important. Because whenever you add a forward scattering, you increase the angle of incidence of the light beam in a, an active layer. And this typically increase the optical path length of the light in the active layer, which should reflect on a higher absorption rates. Some additional feature may appear with making some sort of a coupling. For example, uh, Professor Harry Porter in Caltech have introduced a lot of work related to the Wesmengari modes, but I would say that this is a very sophisticated level related to the um, front light trapping structures. On the other side, when you are considering the back structure or the uh, sometimes we call the back reflector or the matter matter back reflector or a matter or a, a back matter, it should have a, a high reflection capabilities so that it traps the light inside the active layer and minimizes the transmission outside the active layer. And also, uh, uh, as I mentioned, high reflectivity, backward diffraction. So these are maybe the two, the main two functions for these layers. That's why usually we use mirrors, silver mirror, gold mirror. Something maybe silver is the most famous. Sometimes, sometimes maybe we can use zinc oxide here with high reflectivity as a back reflector. This can conclude the second generation. So the first generation was typically a standard PN junction, a fixed standard PN junction with some layers in the front and on the back. The second uh, layer or the second uh, generation was a simple technology. By the way, this is maybe somehow a little bit outside the, the, the focus of the course, but for a thin form technology, we are not going to model this solar cell in terms of a PN junction. We are going to model it as in terms of a PIN junction, so a P dope intrinsic and an I duped layer. Now let's see some examples for a third generation of those solar cell. One of these examples is a Dyson size solar cell, which, which is a typical example for an electrochemical solar cell. Electrochemical solar cell, I mean that the carriers here are, uh, we, here, we are using here a dye, a liquid dye and a liquid electrolyte. That's why it's an electrochemical cell. Okay. It's not only an electrochemical solar cell, but here there is a very important aspect actually introduced by Professor Gatzel when he first uh, introduced or present this solar cell, I think 1988. The main concept here that you make a very important change with respect to the previous generation. In the previous generation, we used to make two processes in the active life. The first process is the electron hole pair generation. So let me go to the conventional solar cell to describe it in a better manner. So here in, in the first generation, we do a very, we do two processes or the, the job description of an active layer include two, include two processes. First, the electron hole pair generation. So photon is absorbed here in the active layer. Electron is generated and the hole is generated. The second is the carrier transport. So whenever the electron is generated in the same layer, it starts to move to create an electrical current. So it, it includes electron hole per generation and carrier transport. Now, whenever we start to go to the Dyson size solar cell, here, yes, you will find the fact that you have died. The function of the dye is only is only to absorb photons. And there is another medium for carrier transport, which is the mesoporous titanium dioxide as an n semiconductor conductor material. So here you make you you use two different layers to do the two jobs. Typically the same like in perovskite solar cells, where you have a perovskite layer, which is responsible only for, for photon absorption. And then you have an electron transport medium and a hole transport medium. So that you split into three layers, a layer for 
only carrier generation, a layer for electron mobility, which is logically should be an n semiconductor material, and a layer for hole mobility, which is should be p top semiconductor material. So this is the basic difference between, of course, there is a lot to say here about difference and pros and cons of the purpose kite with respect to um, Dyson size solar cell and uh, 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 conventional and thin film, but I just going to brief it because as I mentioned earlier, this is somehow beyond the interest of this course as a system level course, but I'm just showing you the developing of the generations started from the conventional solar cell where carrier generation and carrier transport occurs to organic purpose sky that's inside solar cells where we have an a main absorber a whole transport medium and then electron transport medium so this is concludes chapter one about what's inside the solar cell we will have a practical session to solve some design problem related to this chapter and then we are going to start chapter two dealing with a solar or a pv module how we can characterize a PV module, how we make a small circuit model for this module, and how we can study the impact of different aspects like temperature, humidity, dust accumulation on a PV module. Thank you very much for your concentration and see you in the next lecture, inshallah. Bye-bye.